here are the top eight credit card hacks that banks don't want you to know about. But because you follow me for all of the daily finance tips, I'm gonna let you in on all the secrets. As always, all I ask in return is if you could please just tap that little thumb icon, quick thumbs up, we're gonna get ahead and dive right into the video. So as it comes to credit cards and the credit card space, I've been in it for almost a decade. I've had over 40 cards in that time. I've accumulated over 4 million points and miles, and I've actually spent over 1 million of them doing really fun things like free travel and free hotel stays. So when it comes to the world of credit, I've learned a lot, and I'm here to let you in on a lot of those things that I've learned. But the most important thing I need you to do when we talk about credit cards is you must, 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 please pay on time and in full. If you can't do that, you can't be watching this video, you can't be watching travel hack videos, I'm sorry, because the minute you hold a credit card balance and you pay interest, you're paying for my free vacation. And trust me, I appreciate the support, but I do not want anybody to pay for my vacation. So remember, rule number one, make payments on time and in full. Make sure you're keenly aware of your due date, your credit limit, and as long as you play the game right, I have no doubt, sooner rather than later, you're gonna be up 30,000 feet, sipping on champagne, knocking back caviar in your fully enclosed suite. And hopefully these top eight credit card hacks are gonna get you to the front of the plane sooner rather than later. This list is in no particular order, but of course I had to save the best for last. I, I think I'm gonna go from eight to one. So number one is gonna be the best, stick around for it, but all the others are incredibly valuable. So if I talk or go too fast at any point during the video, pause. If you have questions, just drop them in the comment section down below. I'll try to get to as many as I can. All right, let's go ahead and jump in. Coming in at number eight, late fee waivers. I'll be honest, fees suck, especially late fees. And I get it, life gets busy, but then all of a sudden, boom, a $15 late fee, boom, a $30 late fee. Well, I'm here to say, all it really takes is for you to give the bank a call and just ask for a one-time courtesy waiver. And I'll be honest, I may or may not have had like three one-time courtesy waivers. Now, I don't think that you should abuse this by any stretch, but just be aware that for the most part, banks will grant you a courtesy waiver if you just miss once or twice. So don't get stuck there paying that $15, $20, $30 fee pick up the phone and give them a call. Number seven, retention offers. So I don't know if you're aware to this, but for a lot of banks or companies in general, the cost to acquire a customer is usually pretty expensive. So when they have a customer, they wanna keep them. Well, how that works in your favor is if you have a credit card, especially one with an annual fee that you're not sure you get maximum value out of, you can actually call them at let's say the end of your one year anniversary and ask if there is any sort of retention offer associated. So these are usually bonuses that they're gonna give you, whether it's like spend a thousand, get 20,000 points, or they might just give you 5,000 points, whatever it is, you're asking them for a little something to keep you as a customer. When it comes to retention offers, there's two ways to go about it. One, be direct. Hi bank, I'd like to cancel my credit card unless there's a retention offer associated. That one is just very direct and to the point. Some people might feel like, ooh, I don't know if I'm ready to just be that upfront. Totally fine. Option number two, a little bit fluffier, something to the effect of, hi bank, you know, I'm not getting as much benefit out of my car as I would this year. I'm thinking of potentially closing it unless there might be anything. You can just kind of let it ling linger and they'll usually kind of say, oh, you know, Mr. Lang, looks like we can offer you, I don't know, 40,000 points if you spend $2,000 in the next three months, something to that effect, right? Um, and I've gotten this. I've gotten retention offers on American Express cards, Amex Platinum, uh, Chase Sapphire cards in 2020 as well as 2021. So there's different cards that you can get retention offers for. Even the no annual fee ones might be able to give you something, uh, but I always say, if you're considering canceling, or if you just wanna see, hey, after the end of a year, am I gonna get some free money? Pick up the phone and give them a call. Number six, a reconsideration call. So you just apply for a credit card and you got denied. Most people would probably say, ah, shucks. But did you know that you could just call the bank and ask them to actually reconsider your application? And I've actually done that a lot. What you're basically doing is asking for a manual review of your application. And in that process, you wanna to explain to the person reviewing your profile why they should approve you. So in my particular situation, I was applying for a Chase Inc. credit card. Without getting into the nitty gritty of it, they were miscounting an authorized user card I had. The reason it's important with Chase, there's a 524 rule. With the 524 rule, if you have more than five cards in 24 months, Chase denies you. They were counting an authorized user card in the 524. Well, that's not right. And so I had to call the reconsideration line and I actually had to speak to three representatives on three separate instances 
over the course of three hours to get it pushed through. Now that's an extreme case, but I was very confident that, hey, this is a technicality, like you can't deny me based on that. And I ended up getting approved. For most people, as long as you're not breaking like a hard set rule, like a Chase 524 rule or anything to that effect, you should be able to at least call, ask them to explain why you got denied, and then you have a chance for a rebuttal. So something to the effect of maybe you got denied, they say, hey, there's too many hard increase. Well, I would call them like, you know, the reason I actually wanted to apply for your card is because I'm traveling more and just there's so many travel benefits or I just got a new job. I'm gonna be spending a little bit more on furniture and decorating my house or my apartment. Like give them an actual reason of why you want the card. As long as you're not breaking any hard set rule, you should be good to go. And to find a reconsideration line, just Google whatever the bank is in the reconsideration line. Number five, a product change. So when it comes to your credit score, one component that factors into it is your age of credit history, both looking at average age and your oldest card. And sometimes for people, they might have an annual fee associated to an old card and like, oh, you know, it's an old card, has an annual fee, I don't know if I wanna use it or not. Well, I'm saying instead of closing your oldest card, cause that could net negatively impact you, instead you could just do a product change where you call them up and ask them, hey, can you actually just downgrade my card to one that has no annual fee? Number four, you can actually move your credit between different cards of the same bank. So for example, if you have Chase Freedom cards, Chase Sapphire cards, you can actually move the amount of credit extended to you from one card to another. So for example, if you wanted to maximize the 1.5% earning of the Chase Freedom or whatever it is, and the credit limit is only like say $1,000, but you might've had 15,000 on a Sapphire product, you could just kind of shift that around over to the Freedom. Um, that's not a hard pull. You're not applying for more credit. It's just moving what you have onto a different product to maybe capture the cash back. I don't really use that that often, but I know that is kind of like an edge use case of one way to go ahead and shift credit around. Number three, pay as much of your balance as you can the day or two before the statement close date. So you need to realize that your credit utilization accounts for 30% of your total credit score. So your credit utilization is basically how much credit are you using over how much credit is available to you. Now, most people understand that, okay, once a month that gets reported to the credit bureaus, but the day in which it is reported is on the statement close date. And then you have 28 days or something like that from the statement close date to the due date to actually pay it. Why is that important? Well, let's say you had a $10,000 credit limit. Let's say you bought an item for $8,000, but you're like, hey, I've got $8,000 in cash, I'm gonna pay it right off, great. However, when the statement closes, it takes a snapshot. It says, okay, John spent $8,000 of his total 10,000 available credit limit, 80% utilization. That gets sent to all the bureaus. Even though I'm gonna pay it before the due date, and I'm not gonna pay any interest on it, the bureaus are like, oh my gosh, red alert. John is using 80% of his available credit. Yeah, that's gonna uh -uh, ding him and negatively impact his credit score. So I always tell folks, listen, you have a charge coming up. You know when this statement close date is, pay as much off as possible before the statement close date, not the due date, so that your utilization is at least below, at a, I would say at an absolute max, it's below 15%. I like to keep it under 5%. However, you don't wanna pay the whole thing off because you still wanna say that there's a little bit of utilization. So let's say of the $1,000, maybe I pay off like 7,500 and it's $500 against a $10,000 charge, Perfect. That utilization is fine for me. And then before the due date, obviously pay the rest of it off. Paying as much before the statement date as possible could potentially boost your credit score by reducing your credit utilization. Number two, freeze your credit. This one is such an important one for me in terms of just like managing your total financial picture. When you freeze your credit reports from Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, nobody can just pull your credit report without your explicit authorization. I've seen horror stories of people going and buying a car and asking for financing and all of a sudden the car dealer has like pulled their credit four, five, six times trying to get them the best rate. The dealership might be thinking they're doing you a favor to try to find you the best rate, but what that's doing is every single hard inquiry is a slight ding on your credit report. Now, hard inquiries only account for 10% of your total credit score, so it's not a huge deal, but if I don't have to get dinged, why would I do that? Like, why would I let them pull my credit six, seven, eight, nine times as opposed to, all right, you get one pull, pull it, and let's see what we can find as the best. Now, with freezing your credit, it's super easy. You can just go directly to Experience, TransUnion, Equifax, go on their website and find the freeze option. If you need to make an account, make an account and freeze them. Freezing your credit report will not negatively impact you in any way. All it basically says is nobody can look at your credit without your permission. Um, your credit score is still gonna be calculated. The banks are still gonna send information to the credit bureaus. All it basically means is 
Nobody can just randomly pull your credit report without your explicit authorization. For me, everything is frozen. Every single time I apply for a credit card, I will then unfreeze for 24 to 48 hours, apply for what I want, and then refreeze it. In addition, given the fact that there have been so many security breaches, <clears throat> I'm looking at you, Equifax, who ended up losing the personal information of probably every adult in America. So with that as a risk out there, by keeping all of your credit reports frozen, what it means is, God forbid your information was ever stolen, nobody can just take your name and social security number and start applying for credit cards, applying for loans in your name. Because they're frozen, the minute they apply, denied because nobody can look at the report. Again, it's 100% to free. I've had it frozen for years. There is no net negative impact to you. And coming in at number one, you can apply for multiple credit cards and get multiple sign-up bonuses. Now, I don't mean just a card from Chase and a card from Amex, like yes, that is a thing that everyone knows they can do. But what I mean by that is you can apply for a card from Chase and after you get the bonus, 24 to 48 months later, apply for it again. That, folks, is how you accelerate your ability to get to the front of the cabin. For example, when I flew up here, my Cathay Pacific 20,000 first class flight, I actually used a Bank of America Alaska Airlines card twice. I got the bonus twice, and that is how I got to the front of the cabin quickly. It wasn't on spend because I'll be honest, if you're just spending, getting 70,000 miles is gonna take a lot of spending. Instead though, you're basically playing within the rules that the banks outline, right? Sometimes they'll have very explicit rules, 24 months, 48 months, whatever the interval is between when you get a bonus and you can get another one. Sometimes the language isn't there. So kind of gray area, if the language not there and it's not explicitly forbidden, then you could probably get it more than once in a shorter interval than just say 24 months. Now, some banks though, you can't do that with. For example, American Express has a lot of language that says if you get the bonus, you can only get one ever in your lifetime. So if you got an Amex Gold or Amex Platinum, you got one shot to get the highest sign of bonus possible. However, there are banks like Chase, which say it's 48 months. So if you get a Chase Sapphire product and you get a bonus, you have to wait 48 months, which is four years, before you can get another bonus from Chase. And then you have all the cards in between. I would say general rule of thumb I've seen is about 24 months. So if you apply for a card and got a bonus, two years later, you can probably apply for the same card and get the bonus again. I'm telling you folks, if you wanna end up in the front of the cabin, you wanna fly for free, travel for free, or just get a ton of points, this is what you need to pay attention to. And as always, if you're interested in any credit cards, uh, for me, my top travel cards, my top beginner cards, top student cards, 0% interest cards, I'm gonna leave a link down below, you can check them out. If you have questions on credit cards, on any of the hacks that we talk about, please let me know in the comment section as well. As always, I appreciate everyone so much for tuning in. This has been an incredible video. I hope these top eight credit card hacks help you in some shape, way, or form. And as always, I'll catch y'all next time. Peace.